Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today I'm at the wheel of a significant car for the American motoring industry. Yes, this is a fourth generation Jeep Grand Cherokee. This is a Summit model, so it's quite a fancy one. Maybe not the American answer to the British Range Rover, but certainly perhaps an answer to the Discovery HSE. This could be regarded as the car that saved Chrysler. And today, I'm taking it for a drive. If you like reviews of cars that are not the regular run-of-the-mill ordinary stuff, then please do hit like and subscribe. Now, a word from our sponsor, and on with the review. Proudly sponsored by Diamond Bright, keeping the furious fleet shining. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and welcome to the snow. We've got a perfect car for the conditions because this is a 2016 Jeep Grand Cherokee Summit. This is the WK2, the fourth generation of the Grand Cherokee. A car which is significant for a couple of reasons, despite being not that common here on the roads in the UK. First of all, it's a car that ran as a single generation for 10 years, 2011 till 2021, with only minor facelifts, really. But more significantly than that, this car was the first model released by Jeep under Chrysler. And in 2009, when it's just been revealed at the New York Auto Fair, this is the car that convinced the US government to give a bridging loan to Chrysler to let them keep going because this was the faith in the future product that showed the way forward that Chrysler and Jeep were still a viable thing. So without this car, there would be no Chrysler, probably no Jeep anymore. So quite a big deal really. Around the front of the car, it's very obviously a Jeep. We've got the trademark seven slot grille, which has been the subject of litigation in the past and other manufacturers have tried to use a similar number of grille openings. But as the model has grown and got bigger, it's become bluffer and more aggressive. We've got the interesting LED running lights and projector lights. We've got projector fog lights. And we've also got this little sensor down here because this car has got adaptive crews on it. Being the summit, it is loaded with pretty much every toy you can think of. Now coming around the back, we've got a couple of very American things. We've got the, the Summit badge with a picture of mountains on it because rugged and, uh, and that kind of stuff. On the other side, an unusual badge for an American car, diesel, 4x4, very common, diesel, really not common. They called it an economy car in America, or an economy engine anyway, despite well, the fact that compared to what we're used to here in Europe, really not. Electric boot, by the way. The loading that's getting here is obviously quite high because the entire car is, well, quite high up. But once you get inside here, it is an enormous cavern of a space. Although not as big as you actually might expect because having fairly wide wheels, there are quite big wheel wells to accommodate. So there is some quite interesting architecture around the sides. We've got a little cubby well on the left-hand side. We've got 12 volt socket on the right, multiple curry hooks. So you can take a big, big takeaway in the back of here and a subwoofer here on the right as well. Fantastic. An interesting thing to note here is here. The button for closing the boot again is down low. So if you've got lots of heavy bags, I'm going to reach right up high and do like a proper gym workout to close the boot. Just only half a gym workout. Okay, let's go climbing into the Cherokee. Now we have got the lock, unlock situation on the door handle. Now step inside and we have got all of the luxury American style because this is the top of the range version we've got all, all of the toys. So starting on the door we've got a bit of soft touch stuff here in the top. We've got the goldy chromey plastic stuff surrounding the big metal door handle. Moving down into some black wood which is always one of my favourite things. Then we have a bit of leather down here on the armrest which adds a certain texture of luxury. Now being an American car all of the buttons though tend to be a little bit plasticky compared to the European rival. So we've got lots of buttons down here, central locking, electric windows all around, um, folding electric mirrors, you know, all the stuff you come to expect, and auto windows, both front windows. Of course, we've got our Harman Kardon stereo in this version. This is standard on the uh, Summit, but optional, quite expensively, on some of the lower models. Big speaker down here, a tweeter up here, and a third speaker down here as well, interestingly. And the lower section of the door, we've got memory seats, and we've got an okay-ish door pocket with a bottle holder. Now stepping into the car, we have got an illuminated footstep down here. As you climb in, you see we are in a summit, even in the dark. And the seats, of course, are electrical and in every direction you can wish for. Leather, perforated, branded, and are heated and cooled as well. So extra comfort all around. Clomp in with our snowy boots. 
Grand Cherokee. It's a fully digital dashboard, which is rather exciting, especially back in 2016 when this thing was built. Now looking up top, we've got a big pretend leather tea shelf area. We've got lots of room for our coffee to reside. Uh, you can even get a full height cup in there quite easily. You can have a banquet on that, no problem. Excellent work by, by Jeep just there. The designers clearly had everything uh, priority-wise sorted out. Now moving down the dashboard, we have got more of our gold-rimmed uh, accessories. So our air vents are gold-rimmed, our infotainment and center section heating and ventilation, all this kind of pale gold color with a chromey line and insert as well. And I've added a nice bit of tactile uh, NIST, tactility, even that a word even, to these air vent controls because they've got a rubberized section and a chrome outer, so it does feel rather nice and sort of luxurious to, to, to fondle. In the centre, fairly large screen, certainly big by 2016 standards, which has got your sat-nav media controls, even heating the seat controls. That's quite interesting. Uh, this is fairly unusual in, well, 10 years ago, I guess, to have this kind of level of control hidden in a screen. So our heated and cooled seats, heated steering wheel, I'll have that on in a second. This is only just beginning to be a thing, really, hiding stuff behind a menu there. Underneath that we have got the radio controls and we've got some of the essential basics and we've got our, our main heating and ventilation. Nice big dials, rubberized knurled rings, all feeling quite good. Over to the left hand side, more of the nice dark stained wood, which looks rather nice, more of the gold rims. And we've got a lot of space in here. It does feel a long way from the passenger. This is actually not uncommon in American cars to feel like you've got a big transmission tunnel and you're quite a way away from your passenger seat passenger. In the center though, dividing us apart, we have got a large covered area for a big ashtray with aux in, USB and an SD slot, as well as a standard sort of cigarette lighter socket down there. Moving back, we've got twin cup holders, which take a, a nice big cup quite happily, a big gold, big slurp, that kind of thing, all happily accommodated. And this is quite interesting, two rather interesting things just here. First of all, we've got our terrain response area. We've got snow, sand, mud, rock, automatic, a four wheel drive, all this kind of stuff. This terrain response is kind of lifted a little bit from the Land Rover series, the Discoveries Range Rovers of the early noughties. They kind of pioneered these different programs and presets, which the rest of the 4x4 world has kind of adopted um, over the last couple of years. And also quite interesting and contentious is this transmission, because this is a drive-by-wire. And there was a certain amount of controversy about whether this was safe or not when the car first came to market. Moving back from there, we have got a huge leather armrest. Feels really nice to just relax armchair style into. And lots and lots of arm space for your elbows, lots of headroom, shoulder room. And above us, we've got a black suede slash Alcantara headliner, which looks and feels very nice indeed. And a full panoramic roof. Not a big fan of sunroofs, but I do like a pandemic roof making the car feel very, very light and airy. And it does have quite a high belt line, so the windows aren't enormous for such a big vehicle, but that does help make it feel very, very comfortable indeed. Right, let's have a look in the back. Now, climbing into the back of this car, you are not second-class passengers like you are in so many vehicles. You've got a lot of luxury, which is, well, better than the front of a lot of cars, to be frank. First of all, we've got these seats, which have got a big handle on the side. It's the same lovely soft leather with perforations there. Pull the lever and ba-doink. We've instantly got a flat load space floor running all the way through from the boot, so you can put some pretty hefty things in there. Nicely carpeted on the back there. Flip that back there. And we've got the headrest, which folds down as well, so you can see at the back more if you need to. But, if I put the camera down and film myself doing this... Stop sliding camera. <laughs> if I pull that lever back again and push it, we've got ourselves a recliner. You can sit right back in here. Ah, let's climb aboard. Now, big step up into the car. We've got more Harman Kardon goodness. We've got a bottle type cup holder down in the door. A little recess for putting other odds and sods. We've got a string back vest for putting your maps and what have you in. We've got air conditioning vents, so both movable and separate for both sides of the car. We've got a pair of USB outlets, and we've got heated seats here in the back. So the rear seat passengers really are well catered for indeed. And uh, with that glass roof, you do feel like you've got a lot of big, open, airy emptiness. You don't feel at all penned in. Although, unlike in a Discovery, you don't have that grandstand seating situation. So in that regard, you do feel a bit penned in by the higher belt line of the car. Right, shall we go for a drive? Engine's running and it's nice and smooth. 
the heated steering wheel is already too warm. It's, this car gets hot in a hurry. Now, slide, just push the button and slide down to drive. All electronics slightly strange because there's no interaction and it's pushed to release the foot handbrake, or park brake, I should say. And away we go. Oh, that's a violent locking mechanism there, isn't it? We have got quite a wave of torque going on here. It's a V engine though, so it feels smooth and relaxed. Now this is a big car and it does feel big, but being so square and blocky with enormous mirrors, big glass area, you do have a good idea of where you are on the road and it doesn't feel intimidating at all to drive. Very relaxing in fact. So that gear shift, in 2016, 1.1 million 2014 and 15 Grand Cherokees were recalled because drivers were struggling to know if they put the car into park or if it was still in drive. And so there were lots and lots of rollaway accidents. The gear shift was linked to 41 injuries, 212 crashes, 308 cases of property damage, and actor Anton Yelchin, who played Chekhov in Star Trek, was killed by his own car rolling over him. That's all been fixed now, but it did leave a bit of a cloud hanging over the car at one point. The car does have air suspension and paddle shifters as well. And it actually rides surprisingly firmly with, with quite good control through the corners. Like previous Grand Cherokees, the WK2 has a steel unibody, but it was the first one to have independent suspension all round. And the platform was designed by Daimler Chrysler and it was shared with the Durango and the Mercedes W166 GLE. It also had 146% more torsional rigidity than the previous generation Grand Cherokee. With the air suspension, you can raise and lower the ride height, so if you've got awkward clearances to get under or over, you can take care of that. And because it's a proper 4x4, you can kind of get pretty much anywhere you want to. And that quadra lift air ride can raise the thing up by 282 millimetres, or 11.1 .1 inches, as we are talking about an American car. Now, I've said many times I'm not a fan of a fake 4x4, a 4x4 SUV, like that thing, because it's just a jacked up hatchback with worse handling and economy. I do, however, have a genuine soft spot for actual proper four-wheel drives that have got go anywhere capability that can get you out of and well probably into quite a lot of trouble because they serve a purpose. They've, they're the kind of vehicle that means you can tow heavy things, you can get up mountains. Very little triangular team. Wait a minute, which review am I doing today? Across all markets around the world, there were quite a few engines. There's the 3.6 litre Pentastyle V6 making 295 horsepower, the 5.7 litre Hemi V8 making 360. Then there was a 6.4 litre Hemi V8 in the SRT and SRT8 making 470 bhp, and then there was a 6.2 litre supercharged V8 making 707 horsepower in the track cork, which is just frankly silly. And then there are two versions of the Fiat slash VM sourced 3 litre CRD V6 diesel. Inside the USA, it's 190 horsepower because of low emissions. Everywhere else, it's 240 horsepower and 550 newton meters of torque, which does mean it'll do more to 60 in 8.6 seconds. It's interesting as you climb into the car, it, lots of things happen. It moves the seat into your desired position. It lowers the uh, steering wheel down, having raised it up to make it easier to get in. And of course, it raises the rise height up as well, because when it parks, it lowers it to make it easier to get in and out of, and raises up to its correct driving height. So that's all, a lot of stuff happening. You have a little yellow light flashing for a while saying um, ride height raising in time until finally you get right height achieved. So it does ride very well indeed. It's very smooth, it doesn't roll heavily through the corners. You've got reasonably good visibility. These A posts are absolutely vast, but I'll forgive them because they're covered in Alcantara. It is very American in so many ways. The chunky design, the substantial buttons, the fact that everything is plastic. Americans seem to value quantity of toys over quality of interface, if that makes sense. Whereas a European car may have some of the same features. 
if this was a Mercedes or a BMW or an Audi, the buttons and the controls would have far nicer facings. There'd be more use of metal and rubber and higher grade plastics. They might not have as many features though, whereas this, being the American take on things, has got every feature you can think of, but the buttons do feel a little bit plasticky. They're very solid, don't get me wrong. It doesn't feel like they're gonna break off in your hand because they absolutely won't, but they don't have that same tactile. They've, they've done a little bit up here with the rubber on the air vents and the rubber around the knurled rings, but it doesn't feel like an Audi or a Mercedes, for example. Interestingly, when this car was first planned, it was originally intended to be a direct replacement for the standard Cherokee, but they decided along the way that the Cherokee was still selling very well indeed, and it would actually work better as a bigger brother to that car. And five generations on, it looks like they were right. Now this is one of those rare beasts, an American car that's been exported to Europe with very little changes. Now the steering wheel is absolutely festooned with controls. You've got cruise control, you've got adaptive cruise on here, so you've got controls for that as well. It's your audio, your telephone, the various menus. It's absolutely loaded. It's quite a nice thing to hold. It's, it's a lovely, chunky, grippy leather thing with a shiny gloss black at the top. Very, very pleasant indeed to be interacting with. Oh, we didn't do a horn test, did we? Should do a horn test. Oh, that's an eagle flavored pop. I do rather like the sound of, the, of that diesel shunting up and down through the gears. It's a great noise. The brakes are very sharp. And despite the air suspension, the front does dip down quite heavily. It's a big car after all. The V6 petrol weighs 2,056 kilos, whereas the V8 petrol weighs in at 2,388 kilos. Now the owner of this car does do some big miles. Let's find out what it's like on a dual carriageway. Well, I'm doing 60 miles an hour right now. I'll tell you what, it is lovely and smooth and very quiet indeed. Virtually no road noise at all. A bit of tire noise, a little tiny bit of wind maybe, not a lot. All told, a very relaxing car to be in and a great all-rounder. That was interesting, as we got up to a higher speed, it was lowering the air suspension. And uh, as we are just pulling off the dual carriage right now to turn around again, it said aerodynamic ride height achieved. Interesting. Well, thanks for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this big chunk of American beefsteak, off-road, four-wheel drive joy. Lots of leather, lots of toys. The American dream on four wheels, you could say. If you've enjoyed, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.